Are you craving a trip on Space Mountain? Well, we've got the next best thing. Welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauli, and welcome to the season eight premiere of Disney Coast to Coast. Today on the show, I have artist and designer Sam Carter joining me to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Disney California Adventure. Disney California Adventure has seen some massive changes through the years, and Sam was there at the very beginning as he was then working at the Disneyland Resort. He clearly has a lot of love for the park, recognizes its original flaws, and celebrates its impressive facelift. Listen as we discuss the early days of Disney California Adventure, as well as the major upgrades and upcoming additions. It's all coming your way right after this. It's hard to believe that Disney Coast to Coast is now entering its eighth season from a little show that started way back in 2014. For the past seven years, I've been producing and hosting new episodes on a regular basis, never missing a scheduled release date. But I couldn't do it without the support this show gets on Patreon. Disney Coast to Coast may be free for you to listen, but it costs money and takes a lot of time to produce each episode before it reaches your earbuds. So I need to give a huge thank you to Sarah C., Skylar S., Joshua P., Jeanette M., Leah C., Bonnie B, Jeffrey R, Gerardo F, Jared B, Rio N, Philip E, Anna L, James M, Diego P, and Monet P for making this show a reality. It wouldn't be possible for a season 8 of Disney Coast to Coast like the one you're currently listening to right now without the support of these folks. So if you enjoy the show and have the means, join these fabulous folks and head on over to patreon.com slash DisneyCTC to check out how you can ensure more free episodes of Disney Coast to Coast, as well as check out the rewards waiting for you. Once again, that's patreon.com slash D-I-Z-N-E-Y-C-T-C, or you can easily click on the link in this episode's description. Grab the confetti and celebrate a Disney anniversary. Hello, Sam, and welcome back to Disney Coast to Coast. It's been quite a while since I've had you on. Yeah, but this is going to be a good one. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yes, your name has been attached to this episode for a long time because you told me when the 20th anniversary of Disney California Adventure comes around, I need to talk to you on the show. So you are here to talk about Disney California Adventure. Because of course, by then, because we started talking about this last year, of course, by then the pandemic's over, we could have this chat in the park, right? Yeah, yeah, not oh, so much. If, if only. And it's very sad. This is now another anniversary. Of course, Disneyland celebrated yeah. its 65th anniversary closed. Now Disney, and these are big ones too. Now that I think of it, the 65th, yeah. and now the 20th. It's kind the of a 65th bummer. didn't bother me. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because they. I feel like they just went off for the 50th and the 60th. Like, eh, 65th, no big deal. But you know. DCA is kind of like the stepchild, right? In a way, no offense to stepchild, but like, it's kind of like, <laughs> it doesn't really get, you know, everything it deserves sometimes, you know? I think uh, it reminds me of right after Disneyland's 50th, DCA turned five. And I thought, oh, I'm sure they're going to do something big for the fifth. They didn't do anything, right? So I'm like, <laughs> this is crazy. I thought they'd at least take the 50th logo and knock off the zero. So like five, there it is. This There's your logo for the for DCA. No, nothing. So I'm like, you know, you, you kind of think about how far this park has come and, and it's actually a really good park now. And it, it wasn't when it first started. And we're going to talk about that. But yeah, it just deserves, it deserves some praise. And let's give it to it. It does. And of course, we are here to talk about the early years of Disney California Adventure, touch on the grand opening TV special that they had, the transformation of what it's become today and where it's heading. There is a lot to cover, so we'll do our best to touch on as much as possible, but there's no way we'll get to it all. But first, Sam, you just appeared at the Epcot International Festival of the Arts as part of the Wonderground Gallery. In actuality, this is being recorded before you go, but let's pretend for a second. How We're was your future. adventure? Yeah, how was how was it, Sam? Was it great? Well, 
I will say this. I'm going to be in the American Venture all day on January 20th, the inauguration day. Just I, I feel like it's a safe place to be. Oh my goodness! <laughs> How weird is wow. that? Wow! Right? If this is uh, <laughs> if this is the la your last appearance on the show, <laughs> because you get harmed. No, that's oh, going to be intense, huh? You're going to be inside yeah. like the lobby of that attraction. Yeah, you know, at first I was worried about flying during a pandemic, but now I'm worried about flying during a civil war. So it's it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Well, of course, by the time people are listening to this, this is that is the past. So hopefully all is well. I hope yeah, that it I'm all very went. excited, though. I, I, I yeah. can't believe it. Literally, it's dream come true stuff. I've wanted to do artwork for Disney since I was a kid. And to, to know that I get to do that now and kind of pay it forward, it's 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 unreal. So, um, you know, I've been part of Wonderground since two, 2013. But yeah, just lately, a couple of years in a row, cranking out a lot of stuff. But I, I really feel that this last batch of art is like, I'm the most proud of these four pieces and I have been in a long time of stuff, some of my stuff. So yeah, people seem to, to love it. So I'm a happy camper. Yeah, you've got some Carousel Progress, my personal favorite, plus Tiki Room, plus uh, Country Bear Jamboree. And what's the fourth? The Muses from Hercules. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. That's right. Very cool. So excellent. Can you explain before we get to DCA real quickly, what is Wonderground exactly? Is that a Disney owned company or I'm not? Oh, super yeah, I know of it, but I'm, I don't know how it works. The quick version. Yeah, the quick version of that is it's because we all know that there's the Disney gallery um, mm -hmm. at Disneyland. It's on Main Street it used to be in New Orleans Square. But for the, for the most part, the Disney gallery and then off the page in DCA, it's kind of like their their fine art, right? But there's kind of like this pop culture movement of, you know, just artwork that's not your traditional type of Thomas Kincaid style stuff. But um, it's more of just a little underground, kind of similar to like, you know, if you ever go to Artist Alley at Comic Con or something like that, it's almost just like various artists own take on the characters, where what you see in Wonderground for the most part will probably, I'm sorry, what you see in the Disney galleries for the most part on model characters right but what's cool about wonderground is you have like these different artists do their own take on these characters right so it's way more stylized way more out there so it's just it's a different take it's, it's a little bit more lowbrow you know if you were kind of separate the two i love both kinds of art but i definitely fit in better with wonderground you know i if i i could if i i guess if i really wanted to try to do the more traditional on model stuff. But to me, it's just not as fun. I was going to say it's more fun to be able to oh, yeah. interpret it your own way. So Right. Especially when you build up like a collection and people could kind of tell like they see a style of art. They're like, oh, that's that. I could tell that's Sam's, you know, that's when it kind of feels good. But there's a ton of amazing artists that I just can't believe I'm a part of it. So I'm, I'm a lucky guy. Well, congrats. That's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. All righty. Well, let's jump into Disney California Adventure. Of course, it opened on February 8th, 2001 as Disney's California Adventure. That's right. Possessive Disney's. <laughs> yeah. Now, Sam, I know that you have some personal connections to the opening of DCA since at the time you were working for the company. I do. You know, it goes back before that. This is so bizarre. Being a kid, growing up at Disneyland, and just hearing about Walt Disney World. And how they have, you know, at the time, three parks. Actually, at the time, yeah, just three parks because it was before Animal Kingdom. Animal Kingdom opened in 98. Right. So, it, But like even in the early 90s when we just had a parking lot in front of Disneyland, there was, you know, rumors that they wanted to build another park over here and what would it be. And then, you know, hearing about Port Disney and Long Beach and then hearing about Westcott at Disneyland and like kind of hearing like, oh, wow, they're actually putting some some thought and money into this. Let's Let's hope something happens. You know, we all fell in love with Westcott and then it went away. But soon after Westcott went away, they said, hey, take a look at California Adventure. And of course, it was a letdown because we knew that they were going to spend $3 billion on Westcott. And then they're looking at spending <laughs> like, 600 million for yeah. DCA, I believe. Yeah. Less, less than, and that includes like parking structures and the freeways and, <laughs> and hotels and downtown Disney and, and whatever was left went to the park. It was an uphill battle from the very beginning. But um, come in the late 90s, you know, I was working as a float driver in the parade department. But part of a float driver meant we, got, we had to do shuttles and stuff. So sometimes we would do shuttles up to the studios or to Glendale. And a couple times I was doing trips up to Glendale just to kind of – someone needed something taken up there. Like, um, you know, we're either transporting something or someone. And um, I got to spend some time in WDI as – you know, when they're developing California Adventure. 
And one of I have this amazing story. I'll kind of make it fast, but I was in the lobby at Imaginary, and there's this humongous piece of concept art of Superstar Limo <laughs> <laughs> on the wall. Like it was framed all nicely, and it and I really was into Mad Magazine as a kid, and this looked like a Mad Magazine drawing. And it was basically a blue sky sketch of what would uh, literally like an Indiana Jones meets Mr. Toad's Wild Ride version with a paparazzi chase. Like, what would this be? So they commissioned a Mad, a Mad Magazine artist to draw this piece. And it was just like tons of hidden detail. And I'm like staring at it, like deeply focused into this painting. Anyway, Marty Sklar walks by and he sees some kid. I was probably a teenager. Um, he, he sees some kid. And he's like, so what do you think? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. It just starts talking to some random kid. And I'm like, I am... I'm amazed at this. I love it. He's like, you like it? I'm like, I love it. He's like, what do you like about it? Like, he's already kind of like <laughs> doubtful. And then I'm like, well, if you look here, it says, look at Dream Jerk Studio. Like you go through the Dream Jerk Studio. That's hysterical. And then here, and he like looks closely. He's like, what? And he looks closely. And then I'm like, and right over here, like there's a freeway on ramp and there's a white Bronco with a hundred cop cars behind him. Like this is edgy oh, stuff. Geez. This is really funny. And, and he's like, what? And he's like looking really closely at it, even closer. And <laughs> I'm like, right here, Malibu's on fire. And then there's mudslides over here. I'm like, this is just the epitome of a Mad Magazine. And, and I'm here for this. And he just looks closely at it. And he's like, just shakes his head. He's just, and he just like walks away really fast. <laughs> so yeah, I'm knowing, sh- all, <laughs> knowing all that, yeah, I think um, I may have been the reason to, that it you know got shut down. So I knew about the backstory to that ride, for example, and I knew that was the kind of tongue-in-cheek Mad Magazine type humor, and I knew there'd be puns. So I was, they were able to manage my expectations on the park, so I knew what to expect. And unfortunately, with Princess Diana, that changed the whole theory of the ride, where you're you're not going to have a paparazzi chase anymore. Like it was really supposed to be like a a miniature Indiana Jones EMV thing, right? And it really got dumbed down. So. It just basically this park at the beginning had everything going against it because here it is at the footstep of one of the best parks in the world, if not the best park in the world. And it was just such a a shopping mall. It was such just restaurants and everything else was an afterthought, you know, but even though it really did have everything going up against it, but it was still just an exciting time to be a cast member, you know, from the first time that they started tearing up the parking lot, it was just unreal. Like, is this really happening? Like, We've always heard about Walt Disney World getting having all these parks, but now we're going to have more than one park. It was unheard of to like to know, but it really it changed. Like Disneyland changed from being a mom and pops type feel to it really did become a resort. Meaning you can't just drive up to the parking lot, you know, anytime you want and walk right into Main Street. Like it's a whole process, right? Park here, get on the tram, wait to you know get to the front. But it, what do you think about that? Well, it's it's why Downtown Disney was created as well, right? Was that part of it or was that there already? No, no. That, that's part of the expansion too at the time. Um, so, it was just the Disneyland Hotel and Disneyland for the most part. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a major – like you said, it made it a resort. So, right. it had that for it for sure. I want to talk a minute about the concept of Disney's California Adventure. Yes. <laughs> because the concept is that – you know, we're celebrating the great state of California right. in California. And I know that a lot of people have like issue with this, like what a stupid idea you're already in the state. I never yeah. thought it was that dumb of an idea. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, you know, I think I get in a fight in, on Twitter at least once a year over this too. And I, I do like <laughs> courtesy reminders too of like, like anytime you hear someone bagging on, you know, California Adventure, like, oh, it's in California. Why would it be there? Where else would you put this? It's a welcome center for the state. And name one more state in the country that you could have this huge variety of, you know, environments and industry and I- iconic stuff. Like, you know, you can go skiing, you know, um, in the morning and then do some sunset surfing in the afternoon, like certain times of year, right? Like there is that wow factor. And it is like the entertainment capital of LA, even though that's Universal Studios <laughs> tagline. <laughs> but you know, the, the movie industry and you have things like the Golden Gate Bridge and it's like it's world renowned for having all these different things. Um there's an there's other great states out there, but no other state can say that about it. So it makes sense. But the thing that I think that really started California Adventure off on the wrong foot was that idea 
that it was some some executive said that oh you know and it might have been tongue in cheek but someone said oh we're we're going to create this stuff so they don't go out and experience the real stuff like we're going to make a fake yosemite and we're going to make a fake beach and we're going to keep them on property longer i think we really need to give them a little bit more credit not too much credit but a little bit more credit to think that you know what i don't think that was really their intention and i don't think they anyone really thought that oh we're not going to go to the beach because we have paradise pier like give me a break i don't think that's happening and i think that <laughs> became an urban legend and like everyone just rolled their eyes so hard at that concept that they actually thought that, that that was just like another thing going against the park where if, I wish no one even said that to plant that seed, right? Cause that's like the first thing people think about. Now they're already laughing at the, the concept of it before you even got to experience the park. But when they did get to experience the park, there is a stark difference between Disneyland and California Adventure. I think that's the most difficult thing about yeah. it. And of course, we'll talk about, you know, the updates later and stuff. But I mean, to be a directly across from Main Street USA and Disneyland. You're going to compare. You have it's, to. I mean, it's the complete opposite of a mirror image. Not that we wanted the same exact thing, but we, I think everybody wanted the same exact quality at the very least. And Absolutely. And especially if you're going to compare and you, we all, we're realistic. We know that, you know, Disneyland's been around for like, you know, half a century at this time, that it's going to take some time for DCA to kind of catch up, right? Well, look at the same year that, that DCA opened up, Disney Sea opened up. Yeah. Like, you're going to, we're, we're all, all these Disney nerds, like, we're, we're all into this stuff. We're seeing what they're building out in Tokyo. And it just, it just stinks that it kind of just felt like we got the short end of the stick where, and they just opened Animal Kingdom. Awesome. You know, like, here's like this amazingly detailed park that kind of, transported you somewhere and then then they do it again in tokyo with disney seas so it's kind of like we get the short end of the stick with california adventure so it's just, like i said it's another thing going against it it was it's an uphill battle until obviously they fixed it and i do believe that they fixed it you know in 2012 but we'll get there later. The the docu series, the Imagineering story on Disney Plus, does a great job talking about this period where you know if you're working in Imagineering and you're kind of working on Disney California Adventure, you're you do feel like you're getting the short end of the stick when you see what's happening over at Tokyo Disney Sea and such. But I think they did a great job in that documentary describing why it was that way because oh, yeah. of the failure of Euro Disney now Disneyland Paris Resort. Uh, yeah. The, you know, money was a concern. And so there was that. The other thing that, you know, unfortunately it had against it was it was 2001, folks. So it was just months, you know, when it opened, it was just months away from 9-11, which of course right. just hurt everything in the tourist industry. So, And it's it's interesting too is um, I remember going to the cast member preview, my very first visit, which was funny because, you know, at the time I was working in parades and we were opening up the Eureka Parade. And it was the only, it was, it's funny because it was the only time that we had where we were rehearsing a parade in the daytime on route. Uh, we could yeah. because the park wasn't open yet, right? And I, it was almost like a present, like we were unwrapping a, a gift because I remember the first day that we brought the floats out for Eureka out on route. Well, the entire route was covered in carpet to protect the parade route because they, you know, they poured this nice looking cement, had a cool pattern huh. to it. They didn't want cars driving on it. So it was this crappy carpet just rolled out everywhere. We had, we had a large army of people that were, you know, unwrapping the parade route, what, you know, per performance corridor, if you want to talk in DCA terms, it's not a parade route, it's a performance corridor. And so it's, it's <laughs> Do any other funny. parks use that term? <laughs> I'd never I don't heard know. that. But it's actually pretty interesting because there's, at the time, there was no curbs um, for the most part on that performance corridor. And, you know, when we drive these floats down the route, it's kind of like we need the curves to see where people are sitting, right? Yeah. Well, there was no one in the park, like for this first, that first year, right? It was a ghost town. And it was kind of tricky to drive these parade floats down. And, like, you don't really know where the route is because there's no one on route. No one's watching the parade. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it was, it was rough. But, when we finally did open, it, you know, it reminds me of the, the there was buzz because people just wanted to get in the gate. So what, the first few days of those previews, it was actually kind of crowded and there's lines and people checking everything out. But opening day came and everyone already saw it and they didn't really even want to go back. It was it was like tumbleweeds that first opening day. It was pretty depressing. Wow. 
That is crazy. Of course, to promote the opening day, there was a TV special called Disney's California Adventure in California. And number one, you know, obviously it started with Disney's apostrophe S still. And the thing that I found so interesting was this whole in California portion of the title. Because, like, was there confusion about that <laughs> at one point? Were they concerned that people weren't going to understand that this was in California? Maybe they were thinking that there's only going to be one Disneyland park in California. And, like, they keep opening new parks in Florida. And they they didn't want people to confuse it for being another park in Florida. I, I don't know. But... That was really weird and just jumbly because even the title at the time felt jumbly. And now they made it even worse for the marketing thing, right? It just seemed like a, a corporate decision that was just bizarre. And do you remember the commercials they had at the time? I do of like Buzz Lightyear and a bunch yep. of the characters like looking over the wall right across yeah, from Yeah, like Lightyear. they're talking about the new neighbors are moving in. Yeah. And like there's like they show this crane lifting the California, I mean, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge and dropping it into place. So it's another kind of like managing expectations problem that they had where okay there's no disney characters in california adventure they're like you know we didn't learn that problem we didn't learn that how many Deadpool, times right? are they gonna try that Ugh. like i've heard that so many times oh I know. there's not gonna be disney characters because that's not what this park is i've heard that with right. so many parks and, and and what are they using to market the park disney characters like exactly. give me a break yeah. And I, I thought you know from because I, I visited disney world for the first time in 96 and one of the biggest takeaways was the billboards. I just loved all the billboards in Florida for mm -hmm. all the different attractions. And they actually, they didn't have like a billboard for like just a park. They had a billboard for like each different attraction and they kind of went off about it, right? And I was just kind of hoping that they would do that for this, where they would have a billboard for Soren. They would have a billboard for Screaming. They would have a billboard for Grizzly, but they didn't. The billboards were a picture of Buzz Lightyear, Buzz Lightyear with binoculars. Like, mm. come on, can you at least communicate to these people what that there's actually some really good e-tickets in this park? But yeah, it was probably meant they didn't, you know, there weren't like IPs attached to them, right? Yeah, maybe they weren't as IP crazy at the time, right? But they and and it was a misstep to not open up with Tower of Terror and not open up with a rock and roller coaster. Like those two attractions, I think if they open up with, you know, a couple more e-tickets. I think it would have really changed the perception of what DCA was on that first step because there wasn't enough to do. People were in and out, especially because it wasn't even crowded. Um, or if it's winter, it's freezing. They don't want to go on Grizzly. But, you know, Screaming is a great ride. I love I love Screaming. And I love I Soul, miss Screaming. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. That's another story. That's We'll talk about Pixar Pier later, right? But, yeah, it's just so weird. And they still have the Timon lot in the background. And you can just tell that it just it, – it, it was half baked, and yeah. um, and there's too much stucco walls. There was too much lack of theming, and there's too many like like question mark like what are we superstar limo? What is this right? <laughs> like there's just, and I think people were oversaturated in the puns, you know, gone with the chin. yeah. It was it was a very different feel for Disney. It did it didn't feel Disney. It felt it felt cheap, and you know Disney always uses puns in their titles and stuff, but I don't know. It just felt tacky. This was overboard. In this sense. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I do want to talk about the special for a quick second. Of course, uh, in the special, we had Richard Kind and Barry Bostwick from Spin City, as well as Colin Mockery and Brad Sherwood from Whose Line Is It Anyway? Of course, both of those are ABC shows. And Patrick Warburton, who they credit from oh, The yeah. Emperor's New Groove, which is funny because I always just think of from Soren. And we had yeah. John Lasseter in the special as well. And, yep. you know, something was said at the beginning that I found really interesting because I believe it was Barry Bostwick. He goes, uh, oh, it's quite a little park you have here. And Colin Mockery, who's playing the security <laughs> guard, goes, well, little what, park. what do you mean, a little park? It covers 55 acres, has 22 rides, shows and attractions. In fact, it's the same size and has the equal amount of attractions as Disneyland did when it opened in 1955. It has three lands, Hollywood Pictures Backlot, Golden State, and Paradise Pier. Now, this just felt so defensive to me, right at the top yeah. of this Well, TV they had to special. defend themselves already. It was clear, right? It was an, it was an uphill battle. Yeah, it, it felt so weird to have them be like, wait a sec, this is, this is just as good as Disneyland was when it opened, which we all know it wasn't. But like, <laughs> I don't know, I found it very, very weird. That, and I'd never heard of a park having three lands in it. Like, that's crazy. Well, what's weird is it was kind of more of a district, right? Like, because... Um, 
for example, the Golden State area, that counted for the Pacific Wharf, it counted for Bountiful Valley Farm, it counted for Condor Flats and Grizzly Peak, right? So they were calling them three different districts. There's the Hollywood district, you know, the Grizzly area and Paradise Pier. So th there again, like, you know, calling them lands was another trying to associate it with Disneyland. And it's, this is not Disneyland, yeah. right? Which I do think there should be some contrast. And I think as the park started to get a little bit older, I started appreciating it more for everything that you could not do at Disneyland, not just the alcohol. I mean, I did think that was pretty cool, but like <laughs> Rita's Margaritas, that's still an opening day attraction that's still there. I think we should talk about that too. Like what's still there? What hasn't been touched since opening day? There's some things that survive because they're just timeless, right? Like off the page, it's a beautiful marquee. That's still there. The animation building is pretty much the same. We see a bunch yeah. of that in this special. They just updated it with more same. characters. But yeah, that's, I mean, animation, that is a beautiful, beautiful facade there. And then the interior with the with all the movie parts. Yeah, but that special, is, it was. I think it's pretty good. And I'm glad they did that. I think it's actually the, quite horrible. The, oh, really? The, I, I, yeah, I think I was I don't so think... involved at the time. It reminds me of that time period. So I was just excited to be a part of it. The thing that I found so weird about it, though, was that we don't really see too many of the attractions. It's a lot of, like, just chasing them around the park. I don't know. I Like, it almost felt as if maybe they shot it before it was the park was finished, and therefore they didn't have areas they could maybe. shoot. Or they were just like, we don't have much to show, so I, think I don't it know. I think maybe overwritten, meaning that they're, they too many skits and stuff. Like, they spent a lot of time in the soap opera bistro which i'm glad because they got to document that because that did not last long and i think it kind of just they tried to and i like the whose line is it anyway guys and i liked everyone hosting it but um i don't know i always pictured like you know you and i have talked to great lengths of like the anniversary specials for disneyland yeah. i think if they did it more in, in that formula it would have been a lot better like for example, this not that I've spent too much time thinking about it. I have. But if they did something <laughs> like you're going to promote Soren over California, well, have Tom Petty performing live in front of Soren singing, you know, learning to fly or, you know, now live at Paradise Pier, the Beach Boys and have the Beach Boys singing live. If, if they kind of like got music acts and promoted the park that way, it'd been more entertaining. I'm not a fan of that either, though, and I'll tell you why, because it's a new park. Like, I accept it for the parks that have been around for a while where we've seen footage of all of these attractions and stuff. If it's a brand new park, I don't think you should really need anything other than <laughs> what's the new stuff in the park to show. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the problem was Maybe. there wasn't enough great stuff to show in Disney's California Adventure. That's true. And I think that's the problem they ran into. So... I don't know, but let's let's just talk a minute about the giant letters. I think that's one of the things that I honestly missed most about the original park are the <laughs> giant letters at the entrance. I loved them. As like giant and tacky as they were, I thought that they were great. They switched out the design for different holidays. Uh, folks, if you don't know this, you can still catch them and check them out as part of the Cal Expo in Sacramento, California. They were donated there after they left Disney California Adventure after the redesign. And I'm just going to plug something real quick. Uh, this is part of a list that I have called America's Hidden Mickeys. It's a document that I give away where it's it's all different Disney locations around the USA that you can check out. And it's like some really fun stuff that Disney fans uh, might not know about. So if you want to get that, head to DisneyCoastToCoast.com. Just click on free and you can get that document along with a bunch of others uh, for free. So check that out. But in any case, I love the California letters. You know, I had nothing nothing against the letters. I thought the letters were cool. And like you said, when they switched it out to promote World of Color or anything, I thought that was neat. The Golden Gate Bridge grew on me. I thought it was a, a weird disconnect because they did have a San Francisco area, but it wasn't next to the Golden Gate Bridge. I thought that was kind of weird. I never thought about that, but that's totally true. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was kind of weird. And it was iconic in a way to see the, you know, the monorail zoom past the Golden Gate Bridge, which is cool. I don't yeah. know if you know this, but if you take the monorail today, well, not today because it's closed. But if you existing today, the Golden Gate Bridge frame is still there. Like you could take the monorail now and when you go over the Buena Vista Street Bridge, you could see it's still that, you know, international orange uh, hmm. framework that's there. So that's kind of a, a cool throwback if you ever next time you ride the monorail. But the, the big bummer was the Sun Plaza. And I think Sunshine I, um, Plaza. Oh, my God. That is the worst Disney Parks weenie 
of all time. It was a hubcap. It was really depressing. And I'm I'm all for like modern sculpture and cool art like that. But the the wave machine was neat. I did like it, but it just it was just lackluster. There's nothing cool about it, you know, and I really tried to Jedi mind trick myself into thinking it was better than it was at the time. But it was just not good. And you, you walk in there, it just kind of like, what is this place? Right? You yeah. see the Hollywood area, you see Grizzly Peak kind of from the back. They, they got it wrong. They definitely yeah. got it wrong. They were able to do some cool events there over the seasons, right? They did like Santa's Beach Blast right there. And we did some cool stuff for when we eventually brought the food and wine. Candy Corn California Acres. Adventure. Candy Corn Acres I thought was pretty cool too. So yeah. there was they were able to kind of sprinkle some stuff on there, but – I think we all knew that something had to be done and, and it's kind of a miracle that they realized it too. And like that was, that was the first time they have ever had to redo a park like that. Yeah, it was it was crazy. I, I want to touch on – by the way, folks, we love this park and we're going to get to the good stuff. But we got to <laughs> talk about some of the old stuff. I promise I'm the biggest first. fanboy of DCA. It might not sound like it. but I And yeah. this is – I think because I was a part of all of its growing pains to get to where it's at now, which is why I really appreciate it. Yeah. Now you touched on Superstar Limo already. Of course, that has become Mike and Sully to the rescue from Monsters, Inc. The ABC Soap Opera Bistro. I got to be honest, I don't remember this at all. I went in one of the early years of DCA, but I don't remember that nor Superstar Limo really. So I missed out on those. I I think the ABC uh, Soap Opera Bistro is actually a kind of interesting concept where they recreated sets from some of the ABC soaps, Mm -hmm. Port Charles, All My Children, One Life to Live, and General Hospital. Was there something similar to this in Disney's Hollywood Studios or no? You know what? I think it was kind of just supposed to be like, it was. they wanted it to have the same kind of buzz that Sci-Fi Diner had, I guess. I would have much preferred that thing to be here. But, you know, I ate there once and I'm not in the soap operas. I'm not the right, you know, audience yeah. for that. But, you know, I wanted to go check it out. And and I thought hopefully we'll sit in the general hospital room and it'd just be kind of funny to sit in a doctor's office. But is that really appetizing? No. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I think we sat on Port Charles. and That's just, a show I've never even heard of, to be yeah, completely and honest. So it, we were on, it was like this room themed to like the seaside dock. But for some reason, they thought soap opera was the way to go, and it tanked, obviously. So it became Playhouse Disney, like maybe two years later. And then, you know, there were some transplants here. We had Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Play It from Disney's Hollywood Studios coming over. We had Muppet Vision 3D from Disney's which Hollywood awesome. Studios. Which was awesome. So which I'm is glad great. we got Muppets. And, you know, we did have a little Muppet land kind of for a little bit, right? Because you had Rizzo's Pawn Shop store right there. You had Muppet Vision. You mm-hmm. had a really cool kind of scene. And I don't know if you ever heard this rumor. I think it's more than a rumor, but when Superstar Limo closed, like I'm saying, since it was like a Muppet courtyard area, I did hear there's a rumor that they thought about making it Miss Piggy's Superstar Limo, where they would actually- Oh, that would have been great. I know. Remove all those ridiculous animatronics of celebrities. Imagine if they spent whatever it cost for for, uh, Monsters, Inc., Mike and Sully to the rescue. Imagine if they spent that on 100 Muppet animatronics to drop in there. Like, it's perfect. Um, But they decided to do Mike and Sully to the rescue instead. But I I still wish that was Miss Piggy's Superstar Limo. I'm still waiting. You know, I've heard there's that rumor and then there's the one all about the great Muppet movie ride that was supposed to be at Disney MGM Studios. I want that – the Muppet dark ride. This could have been like that. I know. I bet you it was – it might have been had the same team working on it. I'm – like it's a safe because the second half of Superstar Limo is they are in the studios working on movies, so they could have had they probably could have repurposed some of those scenes. Yeah, that's a that's a big what if. Oh, that would have been so cool. Yeah. Now, yeah, you know, th- since Superstar Limo is so infamous these days, uh, it would be fun if archives could like create a walkthrough of it for like the expo or something <laughs> and just recreate the attraction that guests can oh. walk through. I know a lot of it's been reused for Monsters Inc., but how funny would that be? It'd be amazing. What's funny about that is one of the trips I went to Imagineering, I did walk through their little mock-up where they had like a table set up with all those flats. So it's probably like, you know, a, a way smaller scaled version of the ride, but they were able to paint it and have like a little bit of black light on it. So I was able to see it at that stage. Um, but it's it's weird because you go into that corner, that, that back lot area, and there's just nothing there. And that's when it just kind of screamed at me like, where is Rock and Roller Coaster? Like they just opened it. At Hollywood, at MGM Studios at the time, 
like why didn't we get rock and roller coaster here you know and i guess the rumor from what i heard was it was they felt it'd be too similar to either screaming because it's a, another kind of launch coaster and mm-hmm. it's in the dark so it'll just be compared to space mountain so they didn't want to have more of the same kind of ride but i'm like well, we have pirates and small world. They're both boat rides. I think we could have handled a rock and roller coaster, but I would definitely not have wanted Aerosmith. I kept hoping for a no doubt rock and roller coaster. <laughs> I might That'd pick Anaheim, play Tragic Kingdom. I don't know. I thought it would have been so cool. So that was just like another what if that they. I wish they did that would have really helped the perception of the park. Did you ever see Steps in Time in the Hyperion Theater? Because this I wish I had seen just because I love live shows I so much. I did see it. Was and it good? In fact, on my my YouTube channel, I just uplo- uploaded a video of it from the January two thousand one. No, no, it must have been yeah January or February because it's the version one point of the show before they forced in a plot. I don't, I don't know if you heard about how they they opened the show and it was just a, like a series of Grammy type performances of Disney songs. No Disney characters, but just a bunch of talented musicians and dancers singing their hearts off. Like they sang "Go the Distance." There some really good parts to steps in time but then people complained about it because there's no characters so they kind of forced this plot of a, a hip sassy fairy godmother which luckily was played by Eden espinoza so oh, we awesome we love her and that's actually where that um that song that that upbeat version of a dream is a wish your heart makes it's from version 2.0 of steps in time where you know they had eden singing that so that part was amazing but it, it introduced these two kids and had a storyline that was just so sappy and weak that it kind of just made it worse and then the show didn't hang around and eventually they replaced it with blast which i, I didn't really care for that but i know a lot of people did love it plug the uh you said you have video of it that you just uploaded so plug your youtube channel where people can check that out and i'll also include a link in the show notes but What's the YouTube channel called? My quarantine project was starting a YouTube channel where I was just kind of diving into all my old tapes. And I actually found Steps in Time version 1.0, like a really good video of the whole thing. So it's Car Tar Sauce Theater. Fantastic. Well, we've talked a lot of crap about the original Disney California <laughs> Adventure, but we got to admit one of the, uh, the crowned jewel, I think, of Disney California Adventure 1.0 is Soarin' Over California. This is an attraction that has been replicated for numerous other Disney parks. It was a huge success. Even Tokyo wanted. That's how you know it's good. Yeah, exactly. One thing that I found interesting about this was, of course, it was originally called Soarin' Over California, which I was like, okay, there's the California tie-in. That works. But in that TV special we were talking about, it's actually mentioned that more aviation history happened in California more than anywhere else. So I thought that that was a doubly interesting tie-in to the whole California theme. And this was, you know, a unique attraction that we hadn't seen before. And that's always what I want. I always want something I hadn't seen before. And Soren gave that to us and it's still going strong. They've made an update to it even with Soren around the world. And yeah, it's, it's the crown jewel, right? For sure. You know, it made, it made DCA a destination just because like, you have to go to California Adventure just to ride this. And and again, I think it was so great because everyone could go on it. I mean, if you're tall enough, little kids to grandma and grandpa could go on it. And it's at the time, it still is, right? But it was it was something thrilling that everyone could do. And I, I'm extra sentimental about this, especially the, the original version of it, because it must have been 99, maybe 98. But they actually filmed the, the last scene at the family Christmas party at Disneyland. So... I was there with the parade and my my mom was there and my cousins were there. So we're watching this helicopter do these super low passes, like recording the view and then it flies over the castle. They must have done like five or six passes of it. So like when I would watch that, that part of the ride, I could see us. Like I know where we're standing. We're kind of by like the penny arcade and it's just... Just so that's such a like a flashback because I remember so vividly that helicopter flying over that it's just so cool that you know twenty years later you could still kind of see that. That is super cool, and I, I will admit though, it always bothered me that they decided. I mean, my guess is they had a time crunch, but it always bothered me that the end of the film is Christmas. I don't know why they did that either because it, it's fine during Christmas, but what about the other months of the year? That's kind of weird. Uh, My guess is they were just like, we got to shoot this and the decorations are up. So let's just do it. That's my guess. But 
Yeah, it's yeah. an odd choice. It's not my favorite as much as I love Christmas. I would have been more impressed if they shot two different versions and had an overlay that just switched out. I think that would have been like a, a nice Absolutely. Touch. I would have been thrilled with that if during the holiday season they had a different ending. Like that would have been fantastic. I thought you were going to say that the transitions, I thought you, you, you were going to say like the, how it just clips, like, you know, just... No, that actually doesn't bother me. And I kind of prefer that over the whole CG animal thing that they do with around Mm -hmm. the world. Like some of the transitions are fun, but I don't know. Yeah. But you know, what's funny too, is if if you watch it now, and then like you kind of look at the downtown LA part, downtown LA has changed a lot since they filmed that, right? But the weirdest thing is they actually speed it up kind of weird. Yeah. So it just... It kind of feels a little jerky more than it should be. Like it's the only thing that's really sped up, but uh, it just looks dated too. Yeah, the story I heard about that is that that was actually test footage for Soren. And so they did it with a lower quality film and it, they did it on the cheap, uh, essentially, just to do some test footage for it. And so when they decided to use it for the actual, you know, product, they sped mm-hmm. it up kind of so that it, like you couldn't tell that it was cheaper than everything else shot. That's the story yeah, I've it's, heard. It's so. jarring because it's fast. And it's funny because yeah. it's like the area that they're looking at is Staples Center. Right. But it's like before LA Live. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. okay, this is, this is old. Now you touched on Grizzly River Run. That is such a cool area, but I must admit, I don't ride it very often, not unless I'm staying down in Anaheim because I don't mm-hmm. want to be soaked, especially most times of the year. My first memory of Grizzly Peak was, you know, this place is going to look really cool when all these trees grow in. Cause at the time, you know, there's all these baby little shrubs, but 20 years later, you actually do have a forest there now. It looks pretty cool. The only thing it's missing is any kind of bear animatronics. And I've always secretly been hoping for like a Ranger Woodlore and Humphrey the Bear kind of overlay, which is cool because if you've been there in the past couple of years, they redid the safety spiels to be Ranger Woodlore. So I feel like it, it might happen someday. Okay. I'm not familiar with those characters. Who are they? So it's like a, a character that's from like old cartoons from probably like the 50s. But it has like Old a national Disney cartoons? park type of character. Yeah, it's Disney, and it's um, Donald Duck is with them. Um, if you Google Ranger Woodlore, I'm, I'm sure you'll recognize him. He's kind of, they're kind of like the Disney version of Yogi and the Ranger. Uh, you might remember there's a um, uh, environmental trash pickup song like da 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 da. Boom boom. Do you remember that? Where he's picking no. up trash with a stick, the bear? Nope. Oh, you're missing out, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will Google it. I will Google it. So yeah, that area, you know, it is a beautiful area. It is interesting to me, though, how on that TV special, they focused a lot on the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail, which to me, Ugh. once again, is kind of like, there yeah. wasn't much to do in this park. Is kind nope. Like, when you feature a good chunk of that special on the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail, that mm. means your park's in trouble, in my opinion. Well, I kept thinking that's where a new country bear jamboree needed to go. (laughs) Like, I'm like, this is prime real estate to like build something different here. But it's weird. Once I had kids, they love it. Like, they like kids love those playgrounds, which is infuriating for parents who just paid a crap ton of money to (laughs) get these kids into these high tech attractions. But the tire swing is kind of cool. They do have a, a miniature zip line. They got those bridges. They got the net stuff. Like, you know, and. Those ca- there's some cool caves, some slides and stuff. So I get it. But if you've been recently, it's a really cool area for Christmas time, what they do now. So something good that we're finally talking about. Oh, forget about Christmas, Halloween. Yes. The effects were pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. They they killed it for Halloween. But for the Christmas one, they really, they kind of made it feel like Santa's Village in a way, which is very California, right? Like you have the San Bernardino Mountains. It kind of had that cool nostalgia Santa's Village vibe going for it. So, I mean, I just, I love what they're doing for it now. Yeah, let's talk about the original Paradise Pier for a second. We had, Oof. you know, the Sun Wheel and the Malaboomer and the Orange mm-hmm. Stinger, which is the swings essentially. Mulholland Madness, which became the whole goofy sky yeah, school. Yeah, off the shelf. California Screamin', which hearing that music again in the TV special made me yeah. miss it even more. I so prefer California Screaming over in Credit Coaster. I can't even tell you. With Neil Patrick Harris's voice, too, when they when they added that. <laughs> well, we didn't need that. But <laughs> but the, there I mean, listen, this is the area of the park which a lot of like prefab attractions, which feels cheap for Disney. And it's kind of ironic because like it's exactly what Walt was trying to stray away from when he created Disneyland. Yes and no. You know, it's still the Disney version of it. He didn't want like, you know, the um, the dirtiness of it. But 
if you do think about it, it's almost like it, it did have the kinetic energy that we wish that Tomorrowland had, right? You had when you had the coaster kind of zooming all around, you know, say three cars at once going around the coaster, you had the Ferris wheel spinning around, you had the swings, you, you had these things, there's a lot of movement and you had a wave machine crashing onto the jetty as the, as the coaster kind of took off. There was something really cool about it. But I remember when people would see the sun wheel and they'd be like, oh, that creepy face. I'm like, creepy face? That looks like a Mary Blair face. Like it never bothered me. It looked like a, like it was trying to kind of, make a modern version of like a Mary Blair type of sun face, right? But people didn't get it. They, I feel like every time someone mentioned it, they'd say, oh, that creepy sun face. There's too much stucco. Like there was no themed buildings in that area. Like they had the strips, dips, and chips and the Malaburritos, you know, more puns, but more just flat walls and, and kind of like, it just looked like a corner mini mart. Like nothing was really themed. And my first take on it was, why isn't this like a Victorian seaside pier? Why isn't this a throwback to Pacific Ocean Park or something like that? And then Eventually, what's funny about that is we'll they did it, right? <laughs> yeah. So then they, once they made it feel like Main Street USA on the beach, it was it. Like, you know, they brought in the Mickey face on the sun wheel. So now it's the fun wheel, right? But then they also added Toy Story Mania, but they gave it that Victorian look, which was just like, which did it for me. And that was, I think, 2008. And I, I'd feel like that was, Peak Paradise Pier before they change it to Pixar. I think it was around 2010. Maybe, remember, yeah, maybe. Something like that. But yeah, the thing that bothered me more than the sun wheel was the Mickey on the on California Screamin' because his two ears weren't circles. They were like oval shaped. And I was mm -hmm. like, why Why are you doing that? Like, it bothered me so much. I'm like, that is <laughs> not what Mickey's, you know, the three circle Mickey looks like. So uh, I just thought it was an odd choice. But Yeah, I, I think it, maybe it looked good on paper, but to see it that size, it just didn't work out. Like, luckily they fixed it. Tell me if you remember this, because I don't remember this, but I had been told the orange stinger originally smelled like orange inside there. I don't remember that. I had heard that that was a thing, but it attracted bees. So they had to get rid of it because like people were <laughs> That's getting ironic because the seats were bees, right? I actually have a memory of the, the celebrity party of DCA. I saw Jack Nicholson riding the orange stinger at night. That's hilarious. And he had his shades on and he's like, see, Jack. I'm like, that's Jack Nicholson, like just having a blast on the swings, right? Um, <laughs> what, what's kind of weird is if you think about the concept art that they showed of Pixar of Paradise Pier, they did show this like shoot the shoots type of boat ride that had a drop down into the lagoon. Do you remember that? I don't remember that, no. Yeah, there was, so there was a, some kind of boat ride that they were planning on having for the area. And between the fun wheel and the orange stinger, there was a pretty big drop like a perilous plunge type of drop into the lagoon and what's funny about that is if i remember seeing like an old plan of dca there was actually like a track that you could see where the boat would go to after the the drop and if you remember the orange stinger was kind of like floating in the water the boat path was going to go between like around the orange stinger underneath it so Again, more kinetic energy, more things moving, more stuff to do. Now, before we move on to the updates, I do have to mention real quickly Golden Dreams, a cinematic California adventure starring Whoopi Goldberg. I want to know, do you happen to remember when Whoopi Goldberg got her Disney Legends Award? Did they happen to mention Golden Dreams and or Superstar Limo? No, I don't think so, but she was all over DCA. She had Golden Dreams, Superstar Limo, and wasn't she also somewhere in Pacific Wharf? I don't know. I don't. Maybe that don't was know. Rosie O'Donnell. But we got Rosie O'Donnell and Colin Mockery who are still there in <laughs> That's crazy. the in the what is it, the sourdough building? Mm -hmm. Yep, they're you know still what? there. Did you like Golden Dreams? I, it was fine. I saw it once or twice. I think I didn't have any strong opinions about it. You know, what? I saw it once or twice every single visit. Oh, really? You I loved, loved it. it. Okay. I love it's it. like an Epcot film where like most people aren't going to care about it, right? And I love Epcot, so I mean, it was just. Here's the thing too. Okay, when they first started talking about California Adventure, they had this attraction at the main entrance, kind of like where the Sun Plaza sculpture was, right? But at the time it was called Circle of Hands, and it was supposed to be the American Adventure version of California, where it was a huge With animatronic the animatronics? show. Oh, that would have yes. been amazing. Yeah. And it was basically the same script, the same story, but it's like telling the history of California done in the same exact way. And if you look at the old plans for DCA, they had a humongous show building right there, and that was it. It was called Circle of Hands, which I always like to wow. make fun of the title. It just didn't sound cool. But then they they moved it to just being a movie, and then it's they moved it back there. And it's 
I don't know. And it, it, you know, they had to change it because there are some scenes in it that were kind of a little bit brutal. But, you know, that part of history was brutal, right? But I don't know. The song at the end was so pretty. Wasn't Walter not also featured in it at one point? I don't think so. I, I thought I had heard that Walter it, Knott, the creator of Knott's Berry Farm, was like mentioned he been in it if he wasn't. And, and eventually cut. Okay, I had heard he was, but oh. I could be totally wrong. Oh, I think he totally should be in it. Um, no, I thought that was pretty cool. And the song was so pretty. It, it gave me the same vibes, not as much, but of, as American Adventure. And, you know, again, like when I got to see the plans for this stuff before it actually was built, I was just already sold on it before I even got to experience it. All righty. So, you know, that was a lot of the stuff that opened with the park, but it was pretty evident that some changes needed to happen. And they happened pretty quickly. In 2002, we got a Bugs Land, which yep. was not initially intended to be part of the park, but we did have It's Tough to Be a Bug from day one, of course, that was originated at Disney's Animal Kingdom and was brought over. Which I do think had the best queue in all of D in DCA. The queue was amazing. I, and I love that show, personally. I love It's Tough to Be a Bug. I'm sad it's gone. Of course, you know, looking to the future, A Bug's Land closed in 2018 to make way for Avengers Campus, which we're all eagerly awaiting mm -hmm. and should be open at this point, but it's not for obvious reasons. But um, yeah. I don't know. A Bugs Land was kind of that admission of our original concept isn't going to work here. People aren't buying it. Here's the here's the kids' rides. You said there's no kids' rides and no characters. We're fixing that. Let me ask you this though: Do you think the original concept of like just a celebration of California would have worked if they had invested the right amount of money into it, or do you think that that concept is just too broad or too boring for Disney fans? No, I think that's a really good question. Um, I I think the theme of California is the right one. I think it's appropriate, and even more so now. And I, I have a lot of strong feelings about it. But at the time, the, the problem was it was not done in a way that transported anyone. It was still trying to be, you know, they kept saying hip and edgy, like, Ugh, stop it, right? So when it and when anything <laughs> at TCA 1.0 tried to be hip and edgy, to me, it was just like, well, this is trying too hard to be cool. So it's not cool. And and like it I mentioned, cheap too, and about tacky. Like, why isn't this? Yeah, it's tacky. Why isn't this a throwback? Why isn't this taking me back to, you know, LA in the 40s? Or why isn't this taking me to like, you know, um, like the pier in the 30s, which they finally caught on, right? Even so with, with Condor Flats, like, why isn't this an airfield in the 30s? Like Rocketeer, like you could do some really cool stuff. Vintage um, Yost, um, National Park type vibe too. And I think that's when they kind of clued in and they were able to do it right. So I, it was the execution of it. It wasn't the theme. And that's like I said, another thing going against it is like they they tried to make it modern and, and, and hip and like anyone could see that. They don't have to go to Disneyland, a uh, Disney park to see that. So like they want to go to Disney park to be transported. So when they were able to figure it out and transport you to when Walt arrived to California, then it, it, to me, it's a home run. Now, with a Bugs Land there, as I mentioned, that wasn't there the opening year. It, so it was like a farmland area, right? Next to It's Tough mm -hmm. to Be a Bug. And right. how far back did that go? Did that take up the whole space that eventually became a Bugs Land or not? Well, no, the, the Bugs Land was actually built out of the Timon parking lot. They, they oh, took it was a, a parking big, lot. Okay. Mm -hmm, they took a big chunk out of Timon lot at the time. And it was half Bugs Land and half Tower of Terror. Okay. So that was the first time they chipped away at the parking lot. Okay. So that's 2002. Then in 2004, we got the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, uh, you know, a copycat attraction done less good. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting that about survived. that? I've, I've, talked to some, I've talked to some Imagineers about that, and they would argue that it is actually a, a better version of it. At least, like, yeah, I would it say they're insane. The lead up. <laughs> but no, it doesn't have, well, there's a reason Tokyo – there's a reason why Tokyo chose our version of it rather than – the Florida version of it, as, at least for as far as the shafts go and the loading go, like they. Do you kinda, mean Paris? They did perfect it. No, Tokyo has the same ride system. Oh, some Paris ride has system, the same yeah, but they have a whole theme, other right? Yeah. But Tokyo yep. chose our ride system over Florida's ride system, so technically it was superior, but it was missing obviously the fifth dimension, which was really popular. I don't think it made or make or break it, but like. Yeah, if you've been on Florida's, Florida's is better. It just it seemed taller because it was up on a hill. There was a big lead up to it. For us, it was kind of like an afterthought. You turned a corner and, well, are we in a back lot or are we in L.A.? Where are we, right? Like it just it, – there was a, another disconnect that it had there. But at least it was trying to be, you know, themed and all that. But 
Um, I was I was kicking and screaming louder than anyone when they announced Guardians of the Galaxy. And because I, I love Tower of Terror, even though it was like the lesser version of it, I still loved it. Yeah, it was iconic already. But I and I'm a big fan of Guardians of the Galaxy, the the, the new version of it for Mission Breakout. So like I definitely was eating my words and blown away that they did it right. You know, I I don't disagree with you. I love Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. My complaint slash concern with it is when they see great reaction to essentially a fancy overlay, that concerns me. When it's like, oh, we don't have to build new attractions. We can just do (laughs) rethemes. And people seem to be plenty happy with that. That's what concerns me. Same thing with like Incredicoaster, right? It's like whatever big movie's coming out. Don't even No, Incredicoaster is so cheap. Like I can't even with Incredicoaster. (laughs) It's funny because like what bugs me about Incredicoaster is it's the wrong time period. They're trying to throw a mid-century modern into this pier that's Victorian. Like it just that yeah. that's the part that kills me is I don't mind it because it's still the ride itself is still fun, right? The coaster of it, but like you have a Victorian seaside pier with mid-century modern elements. It's just no thank you. I miss that original music so much, but in any case, a little later on in 2010, we get the first nighttime spectacular for Disney California Adventure, World of Color. And I won't go super into depth about this because actually just last year on episode number 737 of Disney Coast to Coast, we did a big episode all about it celebrating its 10th anniversary. But I mean, World of Color was kind of a game changer for DCA, wouldn't you say? Oh, it was a huge deal. Like it was basically DCA's own Fantasmic, right? So if and it was making people choose, do you want to see do you want to see World of Color or do you want to see Fantasmic? And at the time, people were like, I want to see World of Color, right? Because it was just it was just crazy that there was no performers in it. It was just two techs. <laughs> it was just two techs, like, you know, pressing buttons to turn it on, really, as as compared to like this other show that has fireworks and performers and floats and stuff. And it, it really kind of shows because we didn't talk about it yet, but the, they did have a first Christmas show that very first year called Luminaria which I also uploaded to my YouTube channel, which you should check out. You know, it just it gave the idea of like, hey, there's a lot of potential to having a really cool lagoon show here. And then even more so once they opened World of Color, and then they're able to use that for like New Year's Eve fireworks or something like that. You know, just really a, a cool central place to kind of like do that huge extravaganza. And then this around the same time or soon thereafter, this is when we got Paradise Pier 2.0. This is when uh, it became California Boardwalks to the 1920s Victorian Seaside Amusement Park, which we've already touched on. But that was a big upgrade. And I, I just want to make sure p- people recognize there was a Paradise Pier 2.0 before we got oh, yeah. to Pixar Pier, which we'll touch on in a minute. But I personally wish it stayed Paradise Pier 2.0. I thought that yeah. that was a great choice and much Do better. Do you know about the the backstory they had for that when they did 2.0, the Gustav Tinkerschmidt? Do you know about this? No. Oh, man. Okay, so there was a Paradise Pier proprietor named Gustav Tinkerschmidt, and he, he um, had a window over one of the, um, the games – uh, on the boardwalk right there too that kind of had his name on it it said proprietor and all that but there's a, a mm-hmm. backstory written about this guy that was starting the pier and he you know he licensed mickey and had had him on the pier too but there's a whole kind of thing and i always kind of thought like is this kind of like leading up to like a a mystic manner or is he one of like you know is he part of c as well where like you know is he this adventurer it was kind of weird but it never really took off but If you kind of, I think if you Google Gustav Tinkerschmidt for um, Paradise Pier, you might find a a little, some stuff online about it, but really interesting that something that they started, they planted the seeds, but it never went anywhere. And then in 2011, we get the Little Mermaid Ariel's Undersea Adventure, which, you know, I have always wanted this movie to have a dark ride. Mm -hmm. I know some people, at this point, I feel like the park had strayed so far away from that whole California theme that mm-hmm. I didn't mind the film being replaced. No, you know what? Yeah, Golden Dreams, I mean, they, it was prime real estate. It needed more dark rides. And I always kind of thought of Little Mermaid would be a um, – it's a perfect fit for the pier area. We're The dark rides that we're used to are like the classic Fantasyland ones, right? We've grown up with them. They've been there forever. When you have a brand new dark ride, it just kind of feels – I don't know. It's – I don't know if it, if force is the right word, but it's like it's so new that it kind of feels like it, it should be something bigger. But like, no, it's a dark ride, right? It's 
we're surprised. What if it, it was like painted flats, like the original Dark Rides? You know, it, <laughs> yeah, it right. wasn't. There's a really there's some really cool animatronics like yeah. Ursula, as long as her head doesn't fall off. That happened once, but <laughs> um, yeah, there was. Just, I think you know, Little Mermaid's a great ride. Um, the show building itself is beautiful, and I like that they repurposed the rotunda right there. So I, I'm a fan of that. And then 2012 was a big year for Disney California Adventure. This is uh, the opening of Cars Land, which obviously is a beautifully immersive land with a really fun ride, uh, you know, several rides, but one e-ticket ride that's really fantastic. And I just love the fact that it's still... This is the only Cars Land that there is. Oh, yeah. I hope it remains that way. I know there were rumors flying for a while that it was heading to Disney's Hollywood Studios, but it ended up being like a third track for Toy Story Mania instead. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Cars Land, that was kind of a game changer for DCA. Well, yeah, I it think. was actually the first thing at Disneyland that really felt like it was Tokyo good. Like it, like when you go to it, it's like it, you know, it's, it's as immersive as it gets. And I'm not a big fan of Cars, but... You know that. How can you not love that the, the Cadillac Mountain Range? You know, um, it's it's yeah. It really elevated DCA's like you know street credit for having something that good. But for me, 2012 really meant Buena Vista Street. You know that. Yeah. It was so important to like start the park off on the right foot. Getting rid of the cheesy Golden Gate Bridge. Getting rid of the sun sculpture. It just it was able to <laughs> transport you to like. A different era that you that you wouldn't that you can't get anywhere else, and then you tie the Walt connection to it. Then I, I just fell in love with it. Yeah, Buena Vista Street is absolutely beautiful. It's stunning. You know, having the Carthay Circle is awesome. Mm-hmm. Having another Walt Disney statue is fantastic. I mean, mm-hmm. this was such a big change to the park. Everything we've talked about, all these changes with World of Color and Cars Land and Buena Vista Street, all this th- so much so that the park was rededicated by Bob it Iger. Had to. Right in it, 2012, it, it was such yeah. a major difference. It was such a change of in a, a different direction of where they wanted to take the park and why is the park there? Do you know what I mean? Do you know is this when Disney's California Adventure became Disney California Adventure? When did they drop the apostrophe s? It was somewhere around here, right? I think so, and I think that has to do with why they wanted to rededicate it and why they wanted to kind of start over, start fresh with this. It, it had to do with the hierarchy of the name you know you have disney's california adventure disney california adventure and it's almost like the california part it's still there it just kind of took a back seat to disney and you know we we started talking about you know this is a welcome center for california it was more about the california aspect of everything but when they were able to redo california adventure and giving it buena vista street the whole theme of the park changed and like anytime like i said anytime you hear someone talk you know, crap about DCA, like, oh, why is this in California? It still takes place in California, not just because that's where Anaheim is. It makes me think about the very first meetings of California Adventure, how it, they wanted to have like a welcome center to the state in a way, because, you know, Disneyland is a destination. Well, this is your welcome center. The way I look about at DCA now is like the whole theme of it. Like I always kind of ask people, like, what what do you think the theme is of DCA? And they'll say like, oh, it's obviously California, right? But for me, it's The whole theme of DCA now, the way they've redone it, is that it's milestones in the Disney company. And like, what what are you what are you talking about? Well, if you look at Buena Vista Street as the entrance to DCA, that is the time that Walt arrived in LA. You know, from growing up in the Midwest, like you know, Main Street is his childhood. He took a train, right? Main Street train station took a train to LA, and then it's almost like here is the LA that Walt first stepped foot in to kind of do his thing. And what's great about it too, is like, here's, you know, Disney is the biggest entertainment company in the world. And the icon of DCA is his first big risk. It's, it's opening night of Snow White and the seven dwarfs. That is why we have Carthay right there, right? Like it's his first big gamble. And I love that. It's like a, it's a love letter to Walt. It's, it's, it's starting to, to just kind of talk about, the history of the company. And that's his first big thing. And even more poetic is that this whole place takes place at the doorstep of his second big risk, Disneyland. So it, I just love it that here's California Adventure at the doorstep to Disneyland. And with Snow White being the icon, it's the first huge, you know, it's his first animated feature, but really it's like 
game changer. If that night didn't go well for him, none of this would be here. So that's why yeah. it's so important that we have that be an icon to the park. And you know, no one's going to know that. You know, you might if you know a little bit of Disney history, but it's very subtle. And I wish they kind of beefed it up a little bit more. Like have the premiere lights there. Have a limo parked in front. Have the sign say Snow White premiering tonight. I, I, I wouldn't mind if they kind of pushed it a little bit more. Yeah. But then if you think about it too, is like, so park as a whole, California now, it just acts as the backdrop. It just, it's the place where this stuff takes place in. So the same could be said, you know, with, with Hollywood, you have the whole industry. It's the thirties and the forties of Hollywood. You have the um, Grizzly Peak, but it's the, the 1950s. It's, it's, um, national park type theme and that's why it really works to have the ranger woodlore stuff going on over there for the paradise pier yes i do think it would have been better if they kept it not pixar pier but now that it is pixar pier it kind of helps this theme a little bit more as like now well pixar is a humongous part of the disney company so we're going to talk about it we're going to have a pixar area especially that it's right next to cars land and then if you, hopefully someday they could kind of fix the the Goofy's Sky School area and do like a cool Coco area. Anything Pixar would be really great right there. Um, so you have like the Pixar representation with California as like the, the backdrop, right? So it kind of makes sense. And it's by too. the San Francisco area, which is where exactly. Pixar Studios is. Yeah, Exactly. So, I mean, and then, you know, Pixar's from California. So you got to have that representation there too. So this theory I have kind of come, it gets a little weird and wonky when you, start thinking about the Marvel aspect of it. Like, hey, well, why is Marvel here now? Um, you know, it would have been great if the Marvel comics were started out here in LA, but they weren't. They, they, they're from New York. However, who is the main Marvel character? Tony Stark. He has a mansion in Malibu. So, okay, hey, here's our backdrop. Here's our, our California backdrop. And the fact that it takes place in the real world is like why I, I'm okay with Avengers Campus. And that's another huge milestone to the company. You know, they purchased... Marvel. Um, and what's nice too is if you look at the Disneyland Resort as a whole, you, you have a little bit of each entity with its own footprint. You have Star Wars over at Disneyland. It wouldn't work in DCA. You have um, you have our Avengers Campus, so you have that kind of tie-in. But you know, Pixar, Marvel, even and then going back to just Walt's early roots, that's why California Adventure makes sense. It's it's really just a celebration of the company's milestones with the backdrop being California. So, and yeah, I, I did kind of pull that out of thin air. I kind of made it up myself uh, as just like an understanding of like why, trying to give it some meaning, right? Cause it's not just, oh, California's in California. So that's gonna be the theme. No, it's, it's a little bit deeper than that. But that's that that's what I think about the, um, the park. That's why I think it's kind of cool and that it has a little bit of meaning to it. It definitely got shoehorned together in the end, but I I'm good with that reason. Listen, it's a fun park. I enjoy my time in that park. I do wish it had a stronger theme to it. I wouldn't be against a complete name change at this point, honestly. Uh, you know, because, um, yeah. you know, the California things, it's it's stretched pretty thin, I would say. You know, there was talk about maybe like Disney's cinematic adventure or something like that because it's all about movies and stuff. But I think yeah. with the opening, with the first land that you go to being L.A. in the 30s, I mean, mm -hmm. it is California. But yeah, the I entrance certainly is. Yeah. One of the interesting things was with this giant redo that, you know, climaxed in 2012, we that was a one point one billion dollar rebuild. It costs more to fix it than to build it. The original park was 600 million. Like that's that's incredible yeah. to me. And, you know, it's great that they did that and took the initiative. I think that's wonderful. After that, 2017 brought us Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout, and which, of course, is the beginning of Avengers Campus. And then yeah. 2018 brought us Pixar Pier and Paradise Gardens. So... You know, it's seen a lot of changes through the years. Uh, a lot of them are great changes. We've got some fun stuff like the Wine and Food Festival. Lunar New Year happens there. We've even had Disney's Electrical Parade there as well as Paint the Night there. It's not my favorite park for parades, I'll be honest. The parades never feel great in that park for me. That's so funny that you say that about Paint the Night. And I am biased. I worked a lot of parades in DCA and I loved Block Party Bash. But Paint the Night is perfect. For DCA, if you think about it, each unit in Paint the Night has an attraction in DCA. So it made sense that it's almost like the Kiss Goodnight for DCA. It's awesome. It just felt weird in Disneyland. Yeah, I don't <laughs> because know. Because none just... of those themes or characters had attractions there. 
So obviously a ton has happened in Disney California Adventure. Happy 20th anniversary to it. But now let's get to some trivia. Do you know the answer? Get your brain gears churning and play along. It's trivia time. Alrighty, Sam, do you want to hit me with a trivia question first or shall I hit you? Yes, I do. I have a good one for you. Okay, so we all know that, you know, Club 33, pretty exclusive, pretty like, you know, a a fancy place to wine and dine, especially like, you know, the idea of Walt wanted a place like that to kind of host dignitaries, famous people and stuff. So that didn't open, obviously, until New Orleans Square opened, which was what, 66 or so? Where did Walt wine and dine his VIPs before Club 33 existed? I feel like I've actually heard this before, and now I'm blanking. Was it in Tomorrowland? No. No, I mean, the firehouse was clearly too small. The firehouse was too small. Was it in Disneyland you're talking about or someplace? It was. Um, It was. Picture a really fancy dining room, a really fancy dining room that he was able to kind of get away from everything. I mean, not the Golden Horse Show. No. Where? There is a dining room inside the Plaza Inn that had, okay. um, like, if you if you look at the first aid gate, if you know backstage, it kind of goes right there by the in-between. So if you're looking at that gate and you have first aid on your right, and if on the left you have Plaza Inn, there's an old window that was there that, that that room got converted to something else now. It's it's not a dining room for the Plaza Inn restaurant anymore. But it, it was, that's where Walt used to take all the folks there. And like the window's still there. So huh. if, you, if you look for it, that was the, the VIP hangout for like all the famous folks that Walt would kind of entertain after he gave him a tour. Pretty cool, right? Awesome. Very cool. I have a trivia question for you. I want to know. Bring it on. At the end of Soarin' Around the World in Disney California Adventure, we get a flyover of Disneyland Park. There is one major flaw shown in this video that would never occur at Disneyland Park in real life. Do you know what I'm referring to? Oh my goodness. Um, A flaw? Yeah, there's a big problem that if it were real life, because we're flying over Disneyland at nighttime, just like the tra- the original. you see the train, you see the train station. Mm-hmm. It's not Christmas parade, which is great. Yep. Um, what do you see soon after the train station? I don't know. I mean, it's the town square. Yeah, town square. What what happens every day in town square around four or five o'clock? Is the flag up? The flag is waving. And the end of Soaring Around the World, which we all know in the Disneyland. But there's, oh, Town yeah, there's the flag retreat ceremony. There would have oh, been a that's flag a good retreat. One. So, yeah, the flag's waving in Soaring Around the World, which, uh, you know, it is a nighttime shot. So that would not exist in real life, which oh, I that's find. that's interesting. Yeah, yeah pretty. What, is it a CGI flag to be consistent? <laughs> I, I don't think it is, although who knows, maybe it is. But I find that kind of interesting. One thing that I do think is kind of cheeseball about that is how, like, you know, with Disneyland is in the middle of Anaheim, right? So after you kind of fly past the castle, you could kind of see a lot of the buildings in the background in Anaheim. And one of them is like Banco de California. Like <laughs> you can see this neon sign. It's like, can we at least blur that out? Why are we advertising for them? That's so funny. Well, Sam, <laughs> this has been so much fun talking about Disney California Adventure, a park that struggled at the beginning, but has certainly found its way. And I, I look it. very, very forward to it I reopening. Miss it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. Why don't you let folks know where they can find you? I'm usually talking some kind of nonsense on Twitter. I'm at Cartar Sauce, C A R T A R Sauce. You can check out my portfolio, samcarterart.com. I do a lot of gallery type stuff. And if you happen to be at Epcot, take a look at the Festival Festival of Arts, the Wonderground Gallery. But yeah, I'm around. Hit me up. And that's right. We mentioned at the beginning how you already went and did your signings and stuff, but your artwork is there for the length of the festival, right? That's right. Yeah, it already went on sale. I think some some originals already sold, so I'm really excited about that. But we'll have canvases and prints and postcards, something for everybody. And then there's, you know, I'm going to hint to it. The reason I've been talking about the 20th anniversary of DCA for so long is that I I am working on some artwork for that that was going to premiere on February 8th, but the park is closed. So we're going to hold off till probably when uh, Avengers Campus opens up. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a blast. Yeah, I'll see you next time. 
Once again, happy 20th anniversary to Disney California Adventure. If you'd like to check out the TV special we discussed in this episode, Sam Carter's artwork, and other content we chatted about, be sure to visit DisneyCoastToCoast.com and click on Show Notes so you have all of the mentioned links and info right at your fingertips. On next Wednesday's show, it's the return of the House of Mouse headlines, where I'll share with you the latest Disney news, as well as introduce the House of Mouse headlines new format, with Kyle Burbank from LaughingPlace.com joining me to chat about our thoughts on Disneyland Resort sunsetting the annual pass program, and Walt Disney World getting rid of Disney's Magical Express. The easiest way to make sure you don't miss any of the magic is by subscribing to Disney Coast to Coast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Wherever you search, don't forget, it's Disney with a Z, Coast to Coast. And now that this show has ended, check out this episode's description to find links to free gifts for you, helpful info, and learn how you can support the show at no cost to you. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye! Thanks for listening to Disney Coast to Coast! Have a magical day! <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. This podcast is part of the DePodcast Network. Learn more about this show. Plus, find more quality and entertaining podcasts at depodcastnetwork.com. That's D E Podcast Network.com.